Hello and welcome to the OT Schoolhouse podcast, your source for school-based occupational therapy tips, interviews, and professional development. Now, to get the conversation started, here is your host, Jason Davies. Class is officially in session. Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of the OT Schoolhouse podcast. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon and evening with us today. I am your host, Jason Davies, and if you are here, please just type into the chat. Let me know that you're here. Maybe type in there where you're from or if you're an occupational therapist or an occupational therapy assistant. Uh, It just helps us to to feel a little bit more uh, involved and engaged when we see that chat going on, and we really appreciate that. So if you can, take a moment to go ahead and let us know that you are on in the chat. We really appreciate that. Awesome. We have Andres here from an occupational therapist from Illinois. Thank you so much for being here, Andres. Thank you for for typing into the chat. I'm just making sure we've got everything set up, our questions. Uh, Thank you all. We already have 10 likes here. We have, I believe, around 20 people or so watching live. So we really appreciate you being here this evening, this afternoon with us. So we're actually gonna go ahead and get started. We have a very special guest today. Her name is Dr. Beverly Moskowitz and she is an OT, a doctor of occupational therapy. She is a fellow of the OTA, AOTA Association. She has done research and as many of you probably know her, she is the creator of the Size Matters Handwriting Program and also the owner at realotsolutions.com. So I'm very excited to welcome to our show, Dr. Beverly Moskowitz. And there you see her right there. Um, Before I dive in and say hello to Beverly real quickly, thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Debbie, Aaron. Um, All of you showing up, really appreciate you being here. So let's go ahead and let's dive right into it. Welcome to the show, Dr. Beverly Moskowitz. How are you doing today? I'm great, and I'm excited to be here too. I have to share with everybody, this is my first podcast. (laughs) So I'm a little nervous on my end, and I speak all the time, Uh, but honestly, when I'm in front of a camera or a microphone, sometimes it's like I don't even know English. So I hope that this is coherent and fun for you. Uh, I am excited to go forward. Absolutely. And as I mentioned, you know, this is this is very different. Usually when we record a podcast simply for the OT School Hub podcast, we do it without an audience. But today we have a live audience, everyone here from all over the country. And uh, it's just it's going to be an exciting show. Uh, if we have some time at the end, we'll do some Q&A, which will be even more fun. We don't usually get to do that on a podcast, an all audio podcast. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to to get right into this. And You know, the first thing I wanted to ask you actually is about your early career and how you found your way into pediatrics and working as an occupational therapist with kids in schools. Well, first I have to share, I'm doing this for 46 years. I can't even believe that much time went by. It goes by in a blink. So I graduated in the seventies. In the seventies, you could practice with a bachelor's degree. So I got a uh, BS from the University of Pennsylvania, no longer even has a program anymore. And back then you had two rotations. You did adult rehab, you did uh, or rehab and psychiatry. If you wanted to do pediatrics, you had to do an extra three months. I always knew I wanted to work with kids. And so I chose to uh, pursue a third rotation. We called them internships back then. Um, Their field work right now. Um, But I always knew that I wanted to work in in peds. I'm only this big to begin with. So I thought at least I'm (laughs) bigger than the kids. That's funny. Yeah. And so what was your first job, actually? Did you end up directly into a school or were you in a clinic or what did that look like? Okay. So at least for pediatrics, for pediatrics. So first of all, there weren't a whole bunch of jobs out there. Uh, Hospitals or uh, uh, children's uh, clinics, their their school practice wasn't a thing. So um, you really had to be creative if you wanna work with kids. And ultimately you had lots of little contracts. My first contract was in a residential facility and and no back, this is the seventies, that um, kids were kind of warehoused. And I, and I hate to say it, but that was a reality of life. Uh, if you had a severe disability, you were put into an institution. 
So I worked in an institution for a few months. I, I didn't love it. And then I got an opportunity to go to um, the St. Edmund's home for crippled children. And that's what they called it back then. They used that that language because they wanted to get the um, the donations mm. and the, the sympathy money. Um, and uh, uh, they needed a department head. I'd only been working two months. I became the department head. I was a department of one. Uh, so, <laughs> so I... <laughs> worked at uh, St. Edmund's for um, two years. I will share with you, I, I, my career just took off. Uh, the, the church was very generous in sending me to every single course that I ever got a, a flyer for. And I so encourage everybody, if there's new graduates out there amongst you, um, every time that you can read something, take a course, listen to a podcast. Apparently they're educational. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, do it do it. I took everything out there and I really felt like my learning curve had been expedited. Um, and then after that, I got involved with a consulting group. So uh, again, back in the 70s, there was an institution called Penhurst that um, had all of these disabled adults and it had been decided that was inhumane. So uh, different agencies were bringing these, these uh, disabled adults into the community in group homes. I became the coordinating consultant for, and I'm talking to you from Philadelphia right now, um, Philadelphia and the surrounding counties. I went to all of these group homes and created programs for the staff to do with the people that were living in these homes. And I traveled the entire city, I put a lot of mileage on. Um, but again, in, ter in terms of, could you work in pediatrics? You could work in related uh, developmental disability fields. So I would do that for a few hours, but then I would also work in a preschool center and then I would do um, a sheltered workshop and uh, I would do some uh, other residential facilities or home care like you. I worked 15 different contracts. I, I uh, when I started to work in schools, I was still juggling a whole bunch of contracts, but none of it was ever a full time job. If you got a few hours in a school, that was that day, Tuesday mornings, I'm in this particular school district. Then I got one that was an hour and a half, uh, I mean, a day and a half of work. So you you stitched all of your contracts together to make a living. Now, of course, schools have multiple therapists, but uh, I was the only one for around 15 different school districts. I visited more than 60 different schools, sometimes as many as seven in a day. Wow. Wow, that's a lot. That's a crazy wow. Yeah. And, you know, like you mentioned, now it's very different. Whether you work for a district in itself or even a contractor, you're primarily going to be in the schools. There are some contractors that will still have you maybe come back to the clinic in the afternoon or something like that. But for the most part, we kind of stick to either clinic based or school based, which um, is very different than what you were doing, where you'd have so many different contracts at a time. So, um, yeah, that's pretty crazy. You mentioned that you had to go and get some training at that point in your career, very early in your career. What was um, what was concerning to you or what did you feel like you needed to learn in order to do your job and, and what did you reach out for? So um, I learned a lot of stuff in school, but I wasn't really sure if I was being effective. I ha I've always had a drive to know that my time was worth it. It was worth it to me and it was worth it to the person I was working with that I made a difference. So there was a lot uh, back then, we were not an evidence-based profession, but because I had this internal drive, I was always testing myself to see if I could um, make a difference. Was I being effective in school? Uh, was I being effective at home? Did, did uh, people really enjoy the fact that I had been there? Did I make, did I make a difference there? Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was reading, I was learning, I was taking courses, I was trying everything out. You could play around a lot more. That, that actually was kind of nice. Now, an evidence-based practice is definitely the way to go. But when we had no evidence, you were doing your own experimentation all the time. And I was uh, always creative and always trying things out. And that's kind of how the handwriting program <laughs> evolved because I was playing around back then. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you, uh, it, was, it was more loosey-goosey and, and you had to be resourceful. We didn't have an internet. 
<laughs> uh, you know, you had to go to conferences and, and learn mm -hmm. from your colleagues. Yeah. And you mentioned how, um, before we got on here, you actually just mentioned how you never had to do paperwork back then and just how things have evolved. Yeah. Okay. So don't shoot me anybody. This is, um, <laughs> what, so what was school-based OT like back in this, in the, uh, well, I started in school-based OT really in, um, is that uh, our fire alarm going off? <laughs> yeah, I'm in a condo right now. There's a fire alarm going off. Um, uh, so, um, I started working in schools in the late 80s, early 90s, and there was no requirement for paperwork. Uh, I'm not sure that IEPs had reared their head yet, um, but all note taking was a little bit looser and um, nobody knew what I was doing. Now I had been recruited. It was very interesting. My reputation as somebody that understood why I was there. It was never supposed to be about me. It really is about everybody else. And listen, friends, it's hardly like I don't like attention. I'm standing in front of you podcasting right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I know when I'm in a school, I'm really there to serve. I'm there to serve the teachers and the kids and the parents and make sure everyone gets along. Um, so um, uh, I knew that and I was recruited by the, the district in which I lived, which was fantastic because my kids went there. And um, just the same, I wanted them to invite me back. So I created paperwork. I, I created what I called a summary of service report at the end of the year. I wanted them to know everything I worked on so that they thought, you know, we, we should have that back. She does a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Now, of course, we're drowning in paperwork. Um, but I didn't have to go to any meetings. Uh, we had um, no, um, there were no IEPs. Uh, there was no data collection. Um, I will tell you, there was no security. So when I was covering all of those schools, mm. I could drive up to the back door, run in, do my little magic. Of course, I had no office. So I uh, had to do your magic in the hallway, <laughs> in the closet, literally in the closet, uh, on the <laughs> stage, in the cafeteria. Um, you had um, no budget. You were buying your own stuff. Teachers still buy their own stuff. Yeah. It's called an investment in your in yourself. Um, lots of changes, you know, that uh, o over time. Yeah, some yeah. good and not some not so good. Right. And so, do you remember when there was a large shift and when you really started to get invited to IEPs and um, they were starting to ask you maybe for progress on goals? I mean, does that even, or did it just kind of gradually happen over time? So. A little bit gradually, um, but yeah, there was a period of time where uh, th this thing called the IEP reared its head. And and putting this in perspective, um, it, it, it wasn't clear even to the administrators who were training us on how these things worked. They were always opening up their manuals to try and like get a little bit more clarity on, on what uh, OT service should be. And, you know, we were a line item, related service was a line item uh, next to transportation. <laughs> That's, you know, where they, they put uh, related services. So everybody was figuring out, but language started to um, populate the day. Uh, FAPE, free and appropriate public education, was not always a thing. Mm -hmm least restrictive environment. So that was interesting. And um, I had really good intuitions. I, I really felt way back when that um, you want me in the classroom. You don't want me pulling kids out. How, how am I going to know what you need kids to do? How are you going to know what, what I did if I can't show you? So mm -hmm. from the very beginning, even before this collaborative model evolved, before least restrictive environment was more fleshed out as a, as a concept, uh, as a strategy, um, I was pushing into classrooms and I was learning from them. And um, that was something that later evolved, uh, but it, it, it wasn't always the case. Now I'll share with you also, there was a period of time for better or for worse that um, the teachers, the therapists, you wrote the what their treatment plan was going to be, the education plan. Yeah. And uh, then during the 90s, um, uh, I, I forget which president, which act it was, but um, parents got a lot more power. 
And that's a good thing. It actually is good that parents have a say and know that that wasn't always the case. There was a very long period that parents had to accept whatever their school said was the right thing, even if it meant shipping them off, their kids off to a different school, not their home schools. So that, that happened where I was. And then when they started bringing home these kids into our home district, we had to figure out how we're going to accommodate them. Um, so I saw a lot of changes, parents having a voice, uh, bringing in advocates, lots of paperwork, those procedural safeguards. They didn't always used to be a thing. Okay. Now, like, yep. seriously, it was recycled it. Um, but, uh, yeah, a, lo a lot of changes. At this point right now, I, I do think the pendulum might have swung a little bit too far to the side of um, deferring to parents. And listen, I'm a parent too. Uh, but sometimes you want the professionals to weigh in and, and give you some guidance there. I um, observed a Facebook discussion today where an advocate had apparently vetoed all the OT's goals. I'm like, oh, I believe that's overstepping. So, okay, so it has to swing back a little bit. Yeah, and it's hard to find that balance, but you're right. It needs to be a team decision, not a parent decision, not an advocate decision, not an OT decision, a team decision. And so we all have to kind of agree. So yeah, right there with you. All right, I do want to step into the present, but I have one more thing that I want to talk or ask you about how things have changed, and that's evaluations. How have you seen evaluations change over time? So um, I want to talk about evaluations and treatment. Okay. Um, we um, we really didn't have a big repertoire of avails back then. We had some developmentals, um, and that's what we did. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a really good therapist. I have never cured uh, somebody who has an intellectual disability. Yep. Okay. So uh, I, I felt all along, why are you asking me to do developmental avails? The child's always going to not measure up. And yet they're so functional. And, and you really don't need OT services if the teacher can fully uh, include them in all the activities and they're participatory. So that was back then. The evals, the evals have evolved. We have more um, uh, criterion referenced. We still have standardized assessments. I get it. Uh, you need to have some kind of barometer so you can measure change. Not a big fan of a lot of standardized assessments. I'll be honest with you. They typically never speak to what I was working on. So I'm more a fan of what we call now performance-based assessments. I think that was a smart move in evaluations, moving away from a deficit-based uh, evaluation process. I don't want to know all the things the kids can't do. I want to know what they can do. Yeah. And if that's still problematic, that's where I'm starting. So that's been a lovely uh, evolution in our services, moving away from the deficit-based to what we call the strength-based assessment. Um, in terms of uh, um, uh, treatment, um, pushing into the classrooms, I think is, uh, has, is, is the right thing to do. Now, I've been in schools where they have these gorgeous OT departments. I was invited to one of those schools with a gorgeous OT department. And I said to them, so I think this is really mixed messaging. <laughs> like, I don't think you want me to have a medical model. And when parents see this, they want that pullout service. Yep. You really want me to go into your classroom. And, and, and in terms of all that stuff that you have that's in the cabinets that you allowed the previous OT to buy, that's lovely. Well, I don't think you want me using that either. Don't you want me using the stuff that's already in the classroom? Because isn't that the stuff that kids actually have to use during the course of the day? So I'm very practical and my straight talk appealed to a lot of uh, administrators. As I said, my reputation as somebody who, who got it was out there and I never looked for a job. Um, districts always sought me out because they knew that I would do the right thing by, by the district by the by the kids the teachers and the parents and that's interesting because you know we do have this clinic model school model and uh, they they kind of go back and forth you you really don't see the education model going into the clinic but you do see the clinic model going into education a lot and you're right i've worked at districts where we do have a uh, maybe it's one 
clinic at one of the schools where more of the autism classrooms are based, or there might even be a few motor labs or whatever we might want to call them. Um, and that does, it's moving into the classrooms more. It's moving into the schools more, I should say. Um, and so that's, that is a very interesting talk. And we have that talk a lot um, with, with all OTs that I talk to about, you know, what's clinic based, what's educational based. Should we be pulling kids out of a classroom to provide 30 minutes of some sort of um, sensory type of, of therapy? And I, as someone asked me earlier, like, is there research to back some sort of sensory in schools? And there really isn't. Most sensory research that's out there is three times a week for an hour for 10 weeks. I've never seen a school-based occupational therapist have three hours a week with a student. That just isn't going to happen. On the flip side, you're saying, well, that kid's now missing three hours of education every week. Who would agree to that? So also, uh, Jason, our, our charge when we go into schools is to promote function and participation. The research, and if you look up um, uh, Helen Polotyko, um, there's a whole bunch of other articles out there. Um, sensory integration, and I got certified um, way back in the 70s, the, the original Southern California sensory integration test. Yep. Uh, I got certified and all that. Um, but the research on using sensory integration therapy has not shown that it um, facilitates function. That's a problem. That's what we're supposed to be doing in school. And you're going to tell me I'm doing all this swinging and it's not promoting that child's ability to actually work within the classroom. No, it's not. Does it impact the quality of life? Uh, that's, that's valuable. But when we're in school, we really have to get down to how can I give that child the movement experiences I read today um, in Facebook about how do I stop a child from tilting his chair back? Well, don't stop him from falling. Okay, that's <laughs> bad. But um, think of a safer chair because the child's telling you he needs that movement. So yeah. that's the kind of sensory stuff that we can do in school. We should not be doing sensory integration therapy. Now, Lucy Jane Miller at the Star Institute is doing research on how to better measure um, the effectiveness of sensory uh, treatment on function. That those are the, the things that we need to be measuring, because um, when you administer those those SIP tests and you go through all your fancy treatments mm -hmm. and re-administer those SIP tests, there's no significant difference. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I, I know that's going to continue to go on and I know we need more research because there just hasn't I don't think there's been a sensory based program that has been um, studied or researched using any sort of a school-based model and until we get some sort of research where a school where where a sensory model can somehow be integrated into a school model then i don't even think we can truly compare like what could happen at a school versus what can happen in a clinic um there's a lot of research out there we need more research in both sensory I, I, I and always want to be respectful jean Ayers is is you know she's like whoa brilliant we are also indebted to the body of knowledge that she gave our profession um but as as i read today hey listen facebook is awesome and i resisted facebook um okay not as long as i resisted podcasting but i resisted facebook uh and then I discovered these wonderful discussion groups that OTs are having on Facebook. So there was something about weighted vests today, and uh, you know how what's the the protocol for a weighted vest? There is no research supporting weighted vests, weighted blankets. Now that's not to say we haven't found the right variable to measure, exactly. um, because we all know um, how nice it feels to get a nice hug. You know, when our children are upset, how that is what they need. So we need to measure. There's some neurochemicals we have to kind of hook up with some lab and med there's something. Um, but the evidence isn't there right now. It's not there with sensory integration treatment in terms of um, translating into function. So keep your eye on the ball when you're in school. You are a major problem solver looking for ways to promote function. Absolutely. Speaking of function, I think one thing that has evolved over the last 20 years is tiered intervention and RTI. 
And so I would love to know your experiences about RTI. Obviously, you've been talking about how you push into the classroom already. Um, so how have you used RTI over the years? Uh, am I coming across pushy? I, because I guess I am. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> no, I say this jokingly. Um, it always struck me as the right thing to do. So way back, even in the 90s, when they were having um, discussions about kids that were that were struggling, regular uh, ed kids, I would inject myself into the conversation uh, because I would say, um, listen, it, it's such a better use of me now to help him, to help anybody than to then wait until he gets you know, you have to make a referral. Now you commit me to doing an evaluation. Now I got to write, score a test and write a report and go to a meeting. Listen, if you let me come into your classrooms and speak with you now, and actually I bet there's a few other kids who I could help also, we can intercept these at-risk kids. I had this feeling um, way back when, before RTI ever became an acronym, uh, that's, that's the way I wanted to practice. And apparently I... Um, convinced enough people that that's how I built my practice and my reputation. I was somebody, I am not standing on ceremony. I'm going to help everybody. You can, you can um, talk to me in the hallway. You can invite me into your classroom. Now we have, you know, more bureaucracy now, and I get that too. Um, but I always was pushing limits to see how much I would be able to, um, avoid having to get in the into a lot of um uh, red red tape mm -hmm. so um so i i, I said to my minister here's what i want to do uh, i'm never gonna lie i'm never gonna hide it from you this is what i want to do i want you to be okay with it uh -huh. and they would say yeah. okay so sounds okay so so if that is something that sounds comfortable to you if you feel like you know what i could see myself doing it do it level with your administrators I will share, I ran handwriting clubs and um, we called them handwriting clubs. Uh, they just happened to be facilitated by the OT, but we didn't call them OT because if we called it OT, then we would need to have a uh, referral. I don't want a referral because I don't want more paperwork. Listen, I'm just being honest with you. Yep. So <laughs> we, we called it handwriting club. It's true. It's true. But I, but I ran it by the administrators. Here's what I want to do. And they said, sounds fantastic. And then all those at-risk regular ed kids who you know, if you just had a few sessions with them, you tweaked a few things, gave them some adapted writing paper, taught them the rules on letter signs. I'll, I'll get to that. <laughs> uh, you can you can make a difference. And so um, I was playing, I kind of played fast and loose. I was making my own rules up as we went along. We we had no, there were there were no really strict boundaries. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I, I will say that it is um, better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Sometimes, you know, you go into a classroom, you get something working with one teacher, that one teacher. Uh, it's amazing how three other teachers come and ask for your help because you kind of stuck your neck, your neck out there and and got a group going with that one teacher. So I, I absolutely am I'm right on the same page with you when it comes to RTI. Absolutely. I think that should be our motto. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. So what have you found to be the most helpful when attempting to collaborate with teachers? We obviously just kind of talked about how you collaborated with the principal, but what about the teachers? Okay. So um, you got to be real. You got to connect with them and you have to recognize they all went, they're professionals. They went to school thinking, you know, whether they're new grads or they've been doing it for a really long time, that they would be teaching, not sitting in the hallway themselves collecting data all day. They have so many layers upon layers of mandates. Uh, differentiated instruction is the right thing to do. Just the same, they are lesson planning four different groups for their classroom every single day. And, and they have to, like juggling, they're making sure that everybody is 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 active if you go into the classrooms and they perceive that you're about to give them more to do <laughs> they're going to say i'm good thanks okay and believe it or not i i, I believe it 
I did that because I had so many ideas. <laughs> I had so many things I wanted to share. And they basically say, okay, thanks. You know, and they didn't do anything. Okay. So yes, I have been known to overwhelm people. Um, but I learned that um, my best, the best use of my time is to listen to them, to, to recognize we are on their turf. It is not about you and me. And I said that earlier, it's, 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 you know, listen, I'm getting plenty of attention right now. Um, it really is have that mindset where you are there to serve in school, you are on teacher turf, you have to learn what they need to cover. So have those real conversations with them. Tell me about your curriculum. How are you assessing learning? What's your homework look like? Um, how do you set up your, your, your assignments, your room? May I play around. I've been known to feng shui a few rooms because, because I do that. Uh, but I ask permission first. Um, I, I do before I forgiveness because I, I am moving furniture, but I I'll move furniture around. I'm going to bring things. I bring them gifts. It's a, it's, it's a joke. It's not like I'm buying them an outfit or anything, but I will adapt the test for them. Can I try my hand at your test? Because I saw their test. It's visually overwhelming. Maybe I could make it much more linear on adapted writing paper. Uh, could I move some desks around so that our, the child who, who really needs to be front and center, it doesn't have to crane his neck to see the board. Um, uh, to, I, I'm moving him away from the radiator because it makes a whole bunch of noise. Uh, that's a gift you give a teacher. So if you want to have those connections with the teachers, let them know that, first of all, you come in peace. <laughs> I say that to them. I'm not a spy. I'm not here to judge. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm here to help. How can I help you? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I want to learn from you. And honestly, that that kind of attitude will go such a long way in getting those teachers to open up. The ones that are overwhelmed, they, they have a whole new curriculum. They're in a master's program. Their their kids are sick at home. Everybody has a life. Um, they'll they'll share that with you, and you'll say, "No worries." Um, would you like me to to um, to to create that test for you, or to work in this in this center with you? To, they will be so grateful. So, I don't know, being human. Yeah, you know, and some of my best experiences of school as a school based OT comes from working with the teachers. You know, we have great experiences when we work uh, directly with the students, but you get such a reward from working with the teachers as well, and also knowing that your knowledge to one teacher could potentially help 30 kids this year and then even more kids throughout the lifetime of that teacher once they understand something. So um, absolutely. So I want to dive into the Size Matters handwriting program uh, that you so cleverly created, but I think this question might actually lead you there. Um, I mentioned how I love working with teachers and that can be rewarding. What has been a super rewarding part of being a school-based OT for you? Wow, I don't know that I, I um, well, what has been so rewarding? Uh, the connections, the connections with the uh, the teachers, um, the kids, to have people excited to see you in the hallway. Um, I created a little gizmo. We called it the um, the 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 uh, the fudget. There was a device that attached to it uh, 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 legs of a desk that kids would bounce on. Uh -huh. This was before the bouncy band. I had a, um, a model that I could, in 30 seconds, I had installed it. And the principal would say to me, Bev, I need six more in that room. And the <laughs> teacher would say, I went on every desk in the classroom. And the kids would stop me in the hall and say, can I have one of those things? And I'm like, who are you? I don't even know these kids. But I love that they recognized that I brought something into the classroom and they wanted it. I love that the teachers sought me out. They really, um, they wanted my opinion. That, that, um, I had said something, done something that 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 uh, that stayed with them, and um, so that feels really good. And um, there was one story I wanted to share, and I'm sure you all have stories like this right now. But uh, how did I know that I was on the right track? How did I know this inclusion part was going to be working? Very early in the beginning, in the late '80s, early '90s, a parent knew her right. She was. She was having her severely um, cognitively impaired daughter in regular kindergarten. 
cutest little thing, but she had angel mints. Anyone have angel have a student with angel mints? You're you're you're, you're pretty mm-hmm. impaired. Um, but those children were lovely to her daughter. And I sat in a meeting where this parent said for the very first time, she got to go to a birthday party. Her daughter was invited to a birthday party and she was able to sit with the adults because the kids played with her daughter. And if I tell you that story is like 40 years old now, it still makes me cry. That's the right, we're doing the right thing. It's the right thing to do. Wow. Yeah, I've had a pair of uh, brothers with angel men's and you're right, very, uh, they need a lot of support. And so that's that's so kind that some other students, some other kids were able to come and and support. You know, I think as it takes a certain type of person to be an occupational therapist, to be an educator, to be anyone that's going to come in and work with kids, especially kids with disabilities. And I, I think all of us as occupational therapists working in those schools we kind of have that heart that it that it requires. You know, the special education teachers have it too, and uh, that's so. But we want our kids, whether they ever grow up to be teachers or OTs, we want our kids to grow up to be kind, yes. to be able to see somebody with a disability and um, and not be afraid of them, to 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 include them, to talk to them. Absolutely. You make you make such a difference to that parent. Maybe the child doesn't even know, but that parent is most grateful. Absolutely. All right. Well, I know a lot of people know you for the Size Matters handwriting program. This program has helped uh, thousands, if not more, tons of thousands of kids um, and adults around the world to understand. So I want to ask you, starting, what is the Size Matters handwriting program? So as I said to you, I um, way back when, uh, we, you could play around a lot and I was getting all these handwriting referrals and doing everything I had ever learned should be impactful. I'm working on all my core strength, my in-hand manipulation skills, perceptual skills, because I had done those assessments and the kids did really poorly, um, and using the prevailing handwriting program out there. And I'm not making a difference. I'm not, nobody is any better. They're still printing the same way. So back this is probably like 25 years ago, I started to play around with variables I thought might have more impact. And that's when I discovered that when I focused on letter size, the kids caught on really quickly to that. That was really, you know, touching here, touching here. And um, what started to happen, if you ever have taken my course, I tell this story, the special ed kids became the neatest printers in the school. And and, and you know, because everybody's hanging their work in the hallway and I'd go by my classrooms and it looked so beautiful. And the regular classrooms were horrible. So I asked a first grade teacher friend, could I try something in her classroom? I wondered if these these ideas would translate. And I gave a 20 minute, half hour lesson in her room, first grade. That's it. Mm -hmm. Later in the day, she flags me down. Bev, you walked out of the room and everybody's printing changed. One parent later in the week, she said to me, um, uh, the, the teacher uh, ca- uh, caught up with me and said, a parent called to confess that she scolded her daughter for being so irresponsible, bringing home somebody else's assignment book. Hmm. I was there once. So I had the sense that I, uh, I think I'm onto something. And I started to develop it and play with it a little bit. And then I went back to school for my doctorate. Um, and I and I wanted to know what everybody is doing about handwriting uh in the country and in in the world um so you're welcome to read my doctoral work and i stayed connected with temple university because i wanted to test my premises and that's when uh we did and i'll I'll get into the research um uh, we uh designed the largest research study ever done on handwriting and my methods were proven effective uh change scores were significant at a 0.001 level that is massive Absolutely. Actually, go ahead and explain that that research a little bit. How was that put together? We had Beth Pfeiffer on the podcast uh, not too long ago, and she talked about the program. Is this that research or was it a different research? Yeah. So so Beth, Beth, Beth Pfeiffer, everybody, check her out. She is beyond awesome. Uh, she's faculty at Temple University in Philadelphia. So uh, after I finished my doctoral program, I did stay connected with Temple. And I said to them, if you ever have any students looking for a study, bring it on. <laughs> Two years 
later, two doctoral candidates came forward and uh, in what turned out to be this, this first study. Um, now, at this point, I was traveling around the country uh, teaching, and I would always say, if you're interested in being a site for research, let me know. We had around six, seven, eight therapists say, yeah, I want to participate. Let me share with you, when you read the literature and you see the size of a study, be impressed. Yep. It doesn't matter how small, definitely if it's big, it, it you have to jump through such hoops to get to that point where your school is approved for participating in research study. You got to write the IRB, which if you've done that, it's a pretty yep. lengthy thing. By the time we finally were ready to launch, the, the eight schools dwindled to six to five. To, ultimately, we had two school districts. That said, three grades, kindergarten, first and second, control and intervention in both grades, over 200 students, uh, three different standardized or criterion referenced assessments. We had to, uh, our scorers, we had, um, 15 scorers in, in uh, six different states because there were 1,800 assessments to score and they had to sit through training videos and um, and uh, score a sample and earn a reliability coefficient, uh, a 0.80 to qualify. All of that, I wrote, <laughs> in case anybody ever wants to replicate my study, a fidelity manual. So exactly what was happening on day 15 in first grade in wow. Massachusetts was happening in day 15 in first grade in New York and, and so on. It was an eight week study. They did it every day. And, and again, be impressed when research makes it into literature. These people worked hard. I needed to get in and I needed to get out because you're interrupting school. Uh -huh. So it was a very brief period of time. That study was the, Beth was the lead investigator on it. Tammy Murray and Jillian Ray were also part of that study. That got published in um, in the OT Journal of Research in 2015. The second study was the one that you you interviewed Cheryl Zilstra. Yes. Cheryl was a a doctoral candidate at Temple, and she did the second study with Beth Pfeiffer again. Hers was smaller but they correlated handwriting also with reading. So again, I'm reading Facebook. You might think that's my, it's like Wikipedia. That reads Facebook. I don't know, is that a hard one? Like, yeah, <laughs> but but I, I want to see what people are talking about. Um, so yeah, there was this, uh, this advocate who wants technology, no handwriting. And I said, well, do they want the kids to learn how to read? Because uh, uh, handwriting supports reading, technology does not problem solving, creativity. So like, anyway, Sh Cheryl's study showed a very strong correlation between handwriting and letter sound and letter name recognition. That was that study. Um, we had another study. Oh, Anne Lee, Anne Lee. Oh gosh, Lee, Anne, I hope that you're watching. She, um, she wanted to look at the self-monitoring component that we're very proud of. One of the unique features of size matters is that kids can score themselves. If they want to score each other, they can score each other, do some peer uh, monitoring. There is evidence on the benefit of giving kids that power. Huh. So uh, she wanted to, to see whether they're, you know, how powerful that is. So she looked at uh, second graders and uh, wanted to um, uh, ascertain the, the benefit of the self monitoring. They, they rolled dice to determine practice. How silly is that? But Listen, we got we got to defer to it. They roll a, a five; they got to make five star worthy. Yep. And if they roll one, they only have to make one, but it better be star worthy, or you're making another one. Um, the kids love that. And next thing you know, kids are like, "Give me a six. And you have to go, <laughs> Wait, you, you know how this game works, right? They <laughs> love the power. They love the power. So there's the buy-in. The, uh, we had another study. This was thrilling. Uh, this was at a University of Wisconsin Madison. Did I say that backwards? University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, I didn't even know it was happening until I saw it published in Age Odds. I do read my Age Odds. Um, they did a comparison of effect sizes 
of nine different handwriting programs. Some of those that, that may be I saw that one. among your, your favorites. And um, they concluded when it came to legibility, size matters is best. Now they they did conclude we're not as good for speed. 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 I was going to ask you about that. What what what's your reasoning on that? And do you think it's a problem? So that was funny. In that very first research study, the kids did measurably slower. The, the intervention group kids were measurably slower when it came to writing. That said, the site managers in both locations said to me, that was so funny. When it came time for the post-testing, the kids were so careful to touch their pencil to the writing lines in all the right places that they were slower. Listen, we're looking for a longitudinal study. Anybody out there want to do that? We believe it's going to even out. Yeah. yeah. So this was only an eight-week study. If we had a semester, a year, I think you're going to see it even out. But okay, you have to report. That's what happened. Yep. And here's my response. If the kids are writing fast, but you can't read it, who cares? Yeah. And, and to, <laughs> so, be, to that point, what is one of the main things I think teachers say in a classroom to their kids? Slow down. Whether a kid's running across the room or if they're going through math problems too fast, or if they're writing too fast. I mean, to your point, everything we need to slow down in a lot of times for kids, you know, reading too. They're not going to comprehend what they're reading if they're going through it at the pace of a jackrabbit. They need to slow down. And the same thing with writing and everything else. I agree. In the beginning, let's get it right. And as, as you develop that automaticity. Yeah the speed is going to come. Absolutely. All right. Um, what are the main cornerstones that you would say the size matters handwriting program is based off of? Obviously size, it's in the name, but are there one, two, maybe even three other like cornerstone blocks of information that, that you really focus on? So yeah, letter size is, is the biggie. Um, but Science Matters is very responsive to the realities in school. Uh, you have to empower kids. These kids. First of all, if the kids have been on your caseload for a, a while, a few years, they're not happy about it. They, they, they want to, you know, there's something about always having to go to therapy that makes them feel like there's something very wrong with them. They're, they're, we, we, want, we don't want that messaging. Um, this program works quickly. It's amazing if you're not using Size Matters yet. Um, I'm going to suggest it is in your future because I do believe it's the future because it works so easily. Once you correct errors in letter size, that's what makes an immediate difference in the consistency and therefore the readability of the page. And it is so easy to teach because there are only three sizes in manuscript. So I can't undervalue that. When you look at form and every other program is focusing on form, there's 62 of those. Your uppercase, your lowercase, your numbers. And individually, if you looked at the, your kid's writing letter by letter, you could figure out what those letters are. It's in the context of the whole that it's a mess. And that's how you know it's not about form. It's also not about a workbook. So Science Matters is a concept-driven approach. I, I, I often say that you can get started right away with your knowledge alone. You, you don't need any material. Now, we have material. Um, the material can make it faster, make it easier to use. But if you don't have anything, you can get started just by teaching the concepts. That makes it affordable for all those districts that have budgetary issues uh, and who doesn't. You can get started right away just using your concepts. I also share with you stuff that you can make. That's the kind of therapist I am. I mean, we have stuff that's beautiful and you know nicely finished, but I didn't have stuff when I was figuring this out. I made stuff and I'm gonna share with you how you can make, your, make stuff too to share in your classrooms. Um, it's embeddable across the curriculum. That's another thing that no other program can say because it's not about two 15 minutes of practice in a workbook a week. That's not going to get you anywhere. You have to have concepts and strategies that are that remind kids to think handwriting, letter size during science, social studies. They're writing word problems in math. Mm -hmm. And it can be as simple as just having the teacher walk around with dice. When the kids hear the dice, their ears perk up. 
because they know at any moment the teacher could stop by and say, oh, so tell me about that letter. Is it, is it star worthy? <laughs> so on so many ways, um, it, is, um, it is a realistic program. Um, and I'm not done with the research. Uh, we just finished a study up in Florida that was lovely. Um, uh, they're pursuing publication there. Uh, that talked about um, uh, how uh, teachers feel about uh, uh, bringing size matters into their classroom, what the perception is. Uh, we had another study that finished in, um, I want to say, Norristown, Pennsylvania, um, with kids on the spectrum. Uh, we have another study. Listen, there's more and more, and I just say, bring it on. I am <laughs> determined to be the most heavily researched program out there. That's how confident we are. That's great. And how well it works. That's great. We need we need more research in the field of occupational therapy. So uh, yes, go for it as much as as much as you can. Where was I? I was going to ask you. Oh yes. So you go around the world, or at least around. You talked about you might be going around the world soon, but you definitely go around the country and and teach others. What is your hope for the occupational therapist sitting in the middle desk at the third row of your training? What is your hope that they're going to go back to their school and do? Um, I want them to get excited. Um, I'm, as I said, uh, I'm doing this a long time, uh, 46 years, and I'm still excited. I am awed when I go to conferences, and, and I hope that all of you join your state organization, join AOTA, go to conferences. Our profession continues to evolve. We're so very grounded in, um, in the way we approach uh, situations. Um, I, I said to somebody today, I don't think there's ever a problem that an OT can't solve. We just haven't figured it out yet, but give it to an OT because we are so creative. There's so many different avenues to go in there. So I want the therapists coming to my conferences to feel my energy, to feel excited about this awesome profession that you have spent a lot of time and money becoming a part of. The possibilities are endless. But do protect this wonderful profession because there are people, professions, I should say, who are uh, jumping on the bandwagon. And uh, we kind of have taken our eye off of the ball um, by not joining our state organizations. People say, I don't have to, so I'm going to save the dues. Listen, I call it the cost of doing business. Recreation therapists are doing uh, ADLs. They uh, are doing handwriting. They're doing, um, you know, um, they say they own recreation. Actually, recreation was always part of an OT, so no. Uh, PTs are being more functional. They're recognizing that just standing or walking is not nearly as important as when you have to put your book bag in the locker. So they're being more function oriented. And the ABA therapists, don't get me started. Um, they have somehow moved to the front of the the, the desk, the, the conference table, and they're telling us how to practice, and they are not science-based. They're not evidence-based. How did that happen? Well, how it happened is that OT stopped um, representing. And when you see a practice infringement um, and you want to nip it in the bud, uh, the lobbyists, the, uh, the, uh, the legislators in your state say, well, how many people in your state are you representing? How many people feel that way? And the sad fact is that only around 10% of practicing OTs are members of their state organization. So they say, well, how do we know that the other 90% think this is important? That's a point. By contrast, recreation therapists, 90% uh, of those practicing are members of their state organization. Oh my gosh. They took language word for word from the OT practice framework here in Pennsylvania and dropped it into their licensure bill. And amazingly, there was somebody on Capitol Hill in Harrisburg, capital of Pennsylvania, go back, um, who caught it and uh, and said, you can't say that. That's what OTs do. It is happening in your state. So listen, you don't have to be politically active unless you want to be, but you must pay your dues to protect your, your future. Yeah. And then Go to conference, be awed by the many ways that your colleagues have taken this body of knowledge and are applying it. That's thrilling. Absolutely. 
All right, great. Well, um, I want to leave a little bit of time for some Q&A because we do have uh, about 50 to 60 people here with us tonight. Um, but I do want to give you an opportunity to kind of transition because you're working on a new project. Obviously, you have the manuscript Size Matters handwriting program um, that works all on uppercase, lowercase manuscript. Uh, but I think you're working on something in the future, right? Go ahead and explain that. So thanks, uh, Jason. This is, a, this is a labor of love. Uh, for years, people have asked me for um, a Spanish edition, a cursive edition. Um, first of all, I don't speak Spanish, so that was a big stumbling block, block right there. I didn't even know how I would attempt that. Uh, and in terms of cursive, I wasn't inspired. I didn't know how I was going to make my approach different, better than anybody else's. And, um, and then two summers ago, when the country looked like, like, what happened? You know, we're like, can't we all just get along? Uh, I, I got it. I got my inspiration. Um, unlike the manuscript book, which is, there's only one workbook, and it practices a single letter at a time. Teachers are instructed, open up your literacy, social studies. Pluck out words that are meaningful to your curriculum. That's what you want to write. Unlike manuscript, cursive is all about the connectedness. So I actually needed to... Um, identify words for kids to be writing. And I, the words I chose to use were words of kindness, uh, participation, inclusion, disability awareness, things that I think are so sorely um, missing nowadays. I, 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 what happened to civility and us learning how to have a you know, polite discourse? So I have an advisory board and um, we have built on the size matters principles. There's now a size four letter. Uh, there's lots of um, motor learning opportunities where you practice making the movements of the letters. Um, and, uh, uh, and then there's narratives. And the narratives are uh, written at grade level, second, third grade, uh, all these themes of acceptance and awareness and, and kindness with discussion questions. Um, the words that the kids practice writing are extracted from the narrative. So they're a little contrived because I'm always trying to use the featured letter of the page um, on it, but the kids practice uh, these, practice writing words that are meaningful, reading words, and having these lovely discussions about how they might include somebody who, um, Let's just make it simple. Suppose your arm is in a cast. How are you going to write? So it doesn't have to always be heavy handed, uh, but it gets the kids thinking about the challenges that are out there. So um, that's part of the beauty of this book. I will share too, it's illustrated by children. Um, beyond proud of that, uh, my own son did um, illustrate the cover uh, so it's dedicated to him. And uh, if I can just be a little bit personal here, he has a traumatic brain injury. So um, he qualifies to, <laughs> to participate as an artist in this book. Uh, but all of the children are exceptional and the artwork is exciting. And I'm so, so honored at the opportunity to celebrate these talented children. And then that's not all. Um, that's the lowercase pages. I wanted to be authentic when it came to the uppercase pages. And to be authentic, you want to have a proper noun, which is a person, place, or a thing. I cho chose places because these are themes that are relevant every place, everywhere in the world. And so the uppercase pages actually have maps, different parts of the US, different parts of the, the different parts of the world. Europe and Africa and Russia and China and the Southeast Asia. And honest to goodness, I think this book is going to be a keeper because you're going to love it. You're going to, I'm planning a vacation. I had a, like, where are the Philippines? <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow, I got a book that has a map of them. Uh, it's a beautiful book. We are, we have been working uh, a year and a half, my advisory board, and I had a seven hour meeting last Friday because wow. uh, they are so dedicated to this book. Um, I believe that you'll you'll love it. You will keep it. You'll treasure it, and your kids are going to learn how to write in cursive, and how to be um, part of a kinder, more humane society. I love that because I think as occupational therapists, sometimes we forget that 
especially in the schools, that we're part of the education. And the idea that you're putting that geography in there and you're using principles from curriculum and you're, and you're throwing that in there, that's so important. So um, I think that's fantastic. Awesome. I'm looking forward to well, it. Well, there's one more thing that the teacher amongst us uh, suggested that we have additional um, STEM activities, which has now been expanded to STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Mm -hmm. So for those teachers that want to build curriculum, there's a whole bunch of ways to expand on the lessons here, things to learn about. Um, for instance, the, the A page uh, talks about um, uh, accommodations and, um, and adaptations. And I think we talk about Temple Grandin under the STEAM pages. Google her, we tell the kids. A pretty, pretty fascinating lady. Lot, so much learning in this book. I, I'm just so, um, as I said, so proud. So proud. This is a labor of love. Uh, I, I hope that you are interested in seeing it. Absolutely. And, you know, some people are already talking about um, just about the Size Matters handwriting program. So I'm going to actually bring up our first question from Jennifer. I can bring that right up here on the screen for us. And it says, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you. If I would like to start the Size Matters in my schools, where should I start? So, uh, Jennifer, there's a few ways to get started. Uh, you want to learn more about it. Uh, and to learn, we have a, um, so, so my website is called realotsolutions.com. Uh, you can take the three-part self-study webinar series. I am an approved provider of continuing ed through AOTA. So you earn 0.7 CEUs. That's a self-study. Or I'm teaching a two-day live course in February on East Coast time, um, I should probably know those dates and I don't, uh, but depending on where you are, you could do that. In April, I'm teaching a two day course uh, on West Coast time. Two days, the day one is the intro course. It's comparable to the webinar series. If you take the webinar, you can just take day two. Um, day two is a therapist certification course. If you would like to be certified as an SMHP therapist, uh, you want to take the day two course and I send you, I send you a gift. <laughs> I'm going to send you your handbooks, your lab materials, uh, scoring kits, a few little extra goodies in there, free SMHP materials. So that would be a good way to start and educate yourself. If you want to uh, get a proposal for your school, um, I'd be honored. I'm happy to craft a proposal. I always say, um, uh, this is the beginning of a conversation. I want to learn more about you. Uh, whenever schools, districts adopt size matters, they get a free hour of me. I'm going to do training um, on the use of the materials. If you want a CEU course, I'm happy to bring that also to you. Um, but I always want to learn what is your budget? What I don't want to tell you to get something. If you can't afford this, don't get it. We'll make it. We'll make something that's going to be okay. Maybe next year you'll buy the uh, the MRB, the Magnetic Rectus Square Board. Um, but in the meantime, Magnetic Rectus Square Board, it's a big white board that has lines on a pink, yellow, blue markers, very cute. Or you could make lines on your board and use pink, yellow, and blue <laughs> dry erasers. That's cool. Anyway, so I'm going to share with you how you can get started, whether you want a proposal, uh, whether you want to pilot it, another option pilot studies. I can help you design one of those. I always suggest um, ask, ask your administrators if that's okay. Ask parents too if they're okay. Teachers, you want to control in a treatment so you can see the differences um, and take pictures before and after class. A picture is worth 10,000 words. I promise you, you're going to say, as I still say, wait, that was the beginning of the session, the end of the same session. Wow. Yep. All right. This next question kind of leads into where I think you're going anyway. So what are some of your methods for, for providing push in services with the size matters program? Would you provide instruction to the entire class? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, so uh, how would you pilot that or how would you pilot that then for the administrator to see? So, so pilot studies uh, can be as detailed as you want or as long as you want or as short as you want. We've done four week pilot studies, three month pilot studies, full year pilot studies. So first it's gonna start with a conversation of what, what 
do you envision? What per permissions do you need? Parent, administrators, um, and how many classes do you want? How many, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, grades per classroom uh, do you want? So let's let's flesh all that out. We talk about what the training is going to be. And um, I, I like to empower you, so I want you to be trained and you, you get me, you get to talk to me. I'm happy to talk to you. I'm so shy, I know, it's gonna be hard. Um, I'm gonna support you, make sure that you feel like you know how to launch it. So you wanna get collect some baseline samples, which could be as simple as the kids writing the alphabet and a grade level sentence. Date it, initial it. So maybe, you know, we keep it a little bit blind. We, we don't want to, or you number it so you really don't know who the child is. And then um, at the end of whatever interval you decide you want that pilot period to be, that child's going to write the alphabet, upper and lowercase, and that same grade level sentence, and you're going to compare it. I always suggest buy one of those flip books like at Staples Office Depot mm -hmm. that have those um, proposal sheets in it, and you assemble it. When you present that to your administrators, I promise you they're going to go, what? They will. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen it happen. I, I've done something similar. And sure enough, the next year, the principal set aside money in their budget to get a handwriting program. And so definitely it does it does work. Um, I wanted to go a little bit further on Caitlin's question. She asked about doing this in the classroom. I want to be ask you a question that I, I don't know. Everyone's a little bit different. What does it require of you to do with the teacher? Do you think that we can just walk in and, and do this on our own? Or do we need to plan with the teacher ahead of time, collaborate a little bit before we go in and do an entire classroom um, program? Well, you always want to collaborate with teachers because I'll go back to you know where I said we're on their turf. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm a guest. I'm, I'm, I'm there to support you. I certainly don't want to be pushy. So I'm first going to ask, uh, may I come in? Would you, would you like uh, a pilot study? Would you be receptive to it? And you might have teachers say to you, yes, not this year. I'm overwhelmed. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Whatever is going on in their life. Um, and they love you. Um, so first get, you know, have that relationship, that rapport building. Wasn't that like OT 101? <laughs> establish rapport. Um, you want to have that rapport and you want to ask the teachers, what would be a good time to come in? Uh, they may say, I am, we are so far behind in our math curriculum that I need to add extra time on that. So listen, life, <laughs> um, find out when that block of time is, uh, and ask for some regularity. So if this is the block of time, can I come in every day? Mm -hmm. Can I come in three days a week? Um, do I have 20 minutes? Uh, you can get a lot done in 20 minutes if you're organized. Uh, so there's lots of questions to ask and answer before you launch a pilot study. And that said, I tell you this from experience, had a therapist love, love, love science matters, babe. I want to do a research study and, uh, and my administrators, my, everybody's ready to go. And I'm like, I think that this is going a little bit too fast. Um, but she was so enthusiastic. The bottom line was we didn't ask enough questions. And when the study was finishing, it was the end of the school year and it was field day. Well, who wanted to be in class doing a, uh, a post test when it was field day? And even when they sat there, they were really distracted. So uh, we didn't realize there was going to be a vacation overlapping the the time here. Um, ultimately, uh, all that hard work ended up not being a good study. So, yeah, yeah. we always got to look at the calendar. <laughs> all right. Um, there's, we'll do one last question. This is kind of a, a formal, not a formality question, but a question about your course. You already explained this a little bit, but just a little confusion on the difference between the three part self study and the two day course. Ah, okay. So if you want to become a certified SMHP therapist, that's an intermediate level course. You have to take a qualifying prerequisite, an intro course, to be eligible for the certification course. Now, uh, if you followed me at all, uh, you, you may know that I have taught hour-long courses on OT.com, a marvelous site. 
um, those do not count as qualifying prerequisites. They're look at them as like a little preview, a little supplement to what you're learning. Um, but it's not sufficient in itself. Still, definitely, you know, take them. They, they, you get a CEU if you want to do that. Um, the three part self study uh, and the day one course essentially have the same content. Here's the difference the self study, the self study. <laughs> you're, pacing, <laughs> you're pacing yourself. You get to back up if you want to listen to me again. Uh, you can watch it at two in the morning if that's the only time that you're free. Um, you do have to take a post test. As I said, I am an AOTA approved provider. And when you do distance education, there has to be proof that you that you paid attention, that you took the course, you didn't just go to the movies. So each of the, there's three different post tests um, that uh, you have to take. Um, I send you the links to the slideshow, the handout, um, the post test link and the course evaluation link. You have to download the handout. I talk about the lab materials, you don't actually do them. In the live course, <laughs> it's me in real time. Um, I'm going to send you the handbooks. I'm going to send you the lab materials because I believe in uh, fun. So we're going to have fun together doing center time activity. Um, uh, you get to ask questions in real time. Um, the, six, the, the day one course is six hours versus the three part webinar, which is seven hours. So there's a supplemental course if you want that extra stuff that I just couldn't have you sitting there for seven hours. Um, I can't sit there for seven hours either. <laughs> um, so there's a little less content, but essentially the same content in the day one course as the, um, as the self study. Now we do the lab materials in the day one course, um, which we use the next day during the certification course. So it's fun because you get to play the games. There's a lot of games that you play in certification. If you took the, the self-study, you can still play the games. I'm going to let you play. You're just not going to have um, the materials to, uh, to submit one of your samples, um, but you're, you're certainly welcome. A little bit of a budgetary issue, uh, difference too. Um, so you get to decide, this, this works for my budget, this works for my time. And if you can't take two days off in a row, I'm going to tell you, take the self-study and then just join me for the live course. There you go. Good like idea. Certification. All right. Well, Dr. Beverly Moskowitz, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. We've been going on for about an hour, almost an hour and 15 minutes. We've had 50 to 60 people here consistently just loving what you're saying. Thank you everyone who has joined us this afternoon, this evening, it now is. Really appreciate you being here. And I look forward to uh, staying in touch with you, Beverly, and maybe taking that course alongside some of the people that are here today. So uh, maybe we'll that make that happen. That would be awesome. <laughs> oh, I love that. Listen, I, this has been hard for me to um, to read the chat and like look at you all. So <laughs> I would to see that. But I am, you inform me. And I would be honored if you wanted to write to me, bev at realotsolutions.com. I would love to, to um, problem solve with you. Uh, uh, certainly if it's size matters, I'm thrilled about that. But it could be anything in school-based practice. So please don't hesitate. I, I always hope that, um, that above all that, that people feel connected. Sometimes we, we are so isolated out there. Um, and I want people to know that I am uh, it would be my pleasure. You honor me by reaching out and allowing me to learn about your life and your practice. Absolutely. Everyone take that, uh, take that and use it because it's very amazing to be able to uh, collaborate with another therapist just to get a little bit even. Um, really appreciate you offering your assistance there. So thank you, Beverly. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Really appreciate you. And we'll see you next time on the OT Schoolhouse podcast. Take care. Bye. Bye everyone.